everyone. My name is Erin Chantry, and I am the manager of the Urban Design Center in Planning, Design, and Development. I'm very excited to speak to you about urban design, really focusing on the very basic building blocks of what makes a successful, livable, and sustainable built environment. Let's get started. There are many different definitions of urban design. A professor once told me my very first day of my urban design master's, you will spend the next two years learning everything you already know. The truth is that when we break it down, we all know why we have our favorite places and why we might feel comfortable and safe some places while in others we might be nervous or unsettled. Urban design draws together the many strands of placemaking, environmental responsibility, social equity, and economic viability into the creation of a place of beauty and distinct identity. Another definition I really love is urban design is derived but also transcends related topics such as planning, transportation policy, architecture, economics, landscape, and engineering. It draws strands of these together. Let's take a look at all the different elements that when put together create a city. All of these layered on top of one another are what create the built environment as we know it. First is the underlying landscape. A lot of the work we do at the city of Charlotte is infill development, but when designing a place from scratch, often referred to as greenfill development, the most successful places highlight and celebrate the topography, like hills and view sheds. For example, main streets may follow the ridge of a hill, creating interesting views that contribute to the identity of a place. The second is the street network. There is no more important element in the built environment than where streets go and how they connect. When a street is built, all the utilities are put underneath it, like pipes and electricity. Right-of-way is created, which delineates the legal boundaries between public and private land. All of this is extremely complicated to change, almost impossible in some cases. In Europe, many of the streets that are still used today were built by Romans. This is even more important because how streets connect can have a huge impact on things like the amount of traffic, if you can walk to places from your home, if the bus system can work efficiently, and if local businesses can be successful. It's important to remember that streets are the mechanism by which people travel as well as cars. The next is parcels or lots. These are the legal boundaries which allow development. They can be combined or redrawn pretty easily, but their most important function is to organize how buildings are built in relationship to one another. And then the fourth are buildings. As we will learn later, these have an incredibly important impact on how people interact with the public realm, like sidewalks. And finally, public space. Public space is a catch-all term that refers to the space in between buildings. This can be as simple as vacant land or as special as parks and plazas. Urban design relates to all of these elements at all of these scales. Think of a place you love. It may look like something like this. When you look at the elements of this place, you see a narrow street with equal space for people and cars. You see a beautiful view shed of a church at the end of the street. What a nice thing to look at as you're walking down the sidewalk. And it contributes to the identity of this town too. There are mixed use buildings, retail and restaurants on the ground floor with offices and apartments above, ensuring this place is always active and vibrant. You'll always feel safe walking down the street because there are areas full of activity that spill out onto the street, making it interesting and inviting. These are our great places. In the 1920s, federal laws were created that changed all of that and made the places we love incredibly hard legally to create and build. A big underlying principle of zoning is the separation of uses. While this might have had some good intentions, like making sure dirty manufacturing was separated from homes, it also meant that homes became far away from stores, institutions, and other destination. Here's a map of part of Charlotte. You can see commercial uses along our corridors and centers with single-family homes separated out. Since most of Charlotte was developed after the 1920s, this is very common, as it is across most of American cities. Enter the car. The car hits the market at the same time as zoning becomes common, allowing the separation of uses to proliferate. 
Fast forward 100 years later, and now 70% of residents in Mecklenburg County have more than two cars, and 30% of the average person's annual income is spent on cars. The result is this picture, something many of us experience. With growth and dependency on cars comes hours every week sitting in traffic instead of using this time spent on other activities that bring us health and happiness. Here you can see two different realities. On the left is a built environment focused on people, and on the right is a built environment focused on cars. With the separation of uses comes more dependency on cars, and then the places you spend your time reflect your car and not you. I'm sure you'll learn a lot about zoning in other classes, but this is a slide with some terms and things to research further, one being the U.S. Supreme Court case of Euclid versus Amber. The development of our cities in this manner was exasperated by things like the mass production of the car and more favorable bank loans for single-family homes as opposed to buildings with mixed uses. Enter urban design. Urban design is a relatively new term that was created in response to decades of development based on Euclidean zoning. The negative environmental and health effects of car dependency demanded a new career focus in urban planning. Urban design is a concentration on the physical design of the city based on fundamental principles, some of which we have discussed that can be applied at every scale of development. Urban design, therefore, is a vocation or a concentration that exists in these three professions, architecture, landscape architecture, and planning. An architect who is an urban designer may focus on how the design of buildings allow activity to spill out into the street, enhancing the public realm. A landscape architect who is an urban designer might focus on how green environmental systems and open spaces contribute to our cities. And a planner and an urban designer might focus on how streets are designed for and impact larger systems like transportation. A wonderful story and woman I'd like to share with you is Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs is known as the birth mother of urban design. She wasn't a trained planner, architect, or landscape architect, but was an activist in New York City who understood the building blocks of cities and how they directly impact community. This was something that no other urban planner at the time could articulate nor translate to their work. Let's take a look at this video. What we can say is that The Death and Life of Great American Cities is probably the most important book written about cities in the 20th century. She was writing about what made a neighborhood interesting and safe. And that was in complete contradiction to what planners were saying. Some things are said so often that nobody thinks of what they mean anymore. For instance, for years we've been hearing, take the children off the streets. Off the streets and into where? They wanted to have wide boulevards for cars. They wanted grass around all the houses. They wanted to separate uses. Jane Jacobs says, no, no. It may not look good to your aesthetic sensibilities, but this jumble of older buildings actually yields remarkable results. Suppose we actually let the sidewalks do the job that they can do best. And suppose we stop trying to provide poor substitutes for them. You know, in the 50s, there was a very widely felt belief that the city was a mess and that the only thing to do was just clean it up, clear it away, and start over again. Start all over again with stark towers and open space, thinking that would all be better for people. A comparison of yesterday and today makes plain the modern miracle in housing that has taken place. Here in the gas house area, we are on a street that today is just a memory transformed by modern construction magic. What was once a run-down, dying section of the great city of New York has been recreated. And today, this section is a beautiful, park-like community. Well, in fact, it generally was not better for people. Most of the time, it didn't work. And Jane Jacobs saw the evidence that it didn't work and pulled it together into this extraordinary book, which changed the way the world saw all this. It's this wonderful, complex web of things that makes the city what it is, this ocean 
this organic sea of different things mixed together that Jacobs felt the beginning of every morning when she walked out of her own door at 555 Hudson Street. Jane Jacobs was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, does not go to college, comes to New York when she's only 18 years old, really makes a living as a secretary, as an assistant. Then she goes to work for the Architectural Forum in the 1950s, in which case she begins to look at the way cities work. I heard from somebody, I forget who it was, that uh, she was writing a book. And you say, I edited that book, there wasn't very much to edit it, it was in pretty much exactly that manuscript that went into print. I knew that book was going to be around forever and change things, not immediately, but over time. You can always tell. The death and life of great American cities is common wisdom today. Forty-five years ago, it was not. Forty-five years ago, all these very simple, logical, natural ideas were actually radical thinking. Robert Moses was the greatest builder America has ever seen. Robert Moses was this immensely powerful public official who built more roads than anybody in American history. He built Lincoln Center, he built the 1939 and 1964 World's Fairs, he built all the bridges. He just built, 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 built. And almost nobody could stop Robert Moses. With Jane Jacobs, this woman without a portfolio, without credentials, said, by golly, I'll take on Robert Moses. And you know what? There is no such thing as a lower Manhattan Expressway. The insane idea was to build a six-lane expressway from the Holland Tunnel from New Jersey to the Manhattan Bridge over there to Long Island and cut Manhattan in half at the waist, from which it would never have recovered. And when, after 12 years, the neighborhood was successful in stopping it, they planted a little tree, and now it's a medium-sized tree. Not a very beautiful tree, but that's what it stands for the survival of a great neighborhood, thanks to Jane. When the fight was going on about a, a football stadium for the Jets on the west side of Manhattan, I was amazed to see that the people promoting it were talking about how it would also have tucked into the bottom lots of little shops and bars and restaurants and would promote the vibrant street life of New York. Well, what better indication of how Jane Jacobs has entered the mainstream than to see people think that they can sell a huge stadium project by claiming it is somehow consistent with Jane Jacobs' ideas. Did Jane Jacobs lose or win? Well, you know, she probably would say she lost uh, in the sense that we still have a country that's pretty much built around ideas that she despises. Other than hint, wouldn't any of us be thrilled to think that we had the influence that she did, that we changed the thought of millions of people? So I would have to say, that Jane Jacobs certainly was a winner more than most of us are ever winners. The next time you're looking for a great book, pick up The Death and Life of Great American Cities, and you'll be at least halfway to truly understanding and being an expert in urban design. When we're looking at what makes urban design most successful, we can really break it down into three categories, social, economic, and environmental sustainability. Socially, urban design should allow and encourage social inclusion, build community and foster relationships between people, and create safe environments. Economically, urban design should increase visibility for businesses, contribute to an increase in value, and create opportunities for employment. And environmentally, urban design should allow for efficient transit systems, a place where people want to use different types of transportation, like bikes or scooters, and make less trips and cars possible every day. Next, we're going to focus on that fifth layer of the built environment, public space. We're going to go through the top 10 urban design elements that exist in the public realm. If our development can get these things right, we can bring back many of the characteristics into our built environment that Jane Jacobs celebrated so much. Streets and streetscapes. A successful streetscape will have enough room for all of these elements. Travel lanes will be separated from the sidewalk by on-street parking and amenity zone, or buffer. A buffer usually has street trees, landscaping, and space for benches or other street furniture. On-street parking supports local businesses while creating a physical barrier between moving cars and people. 
Sidewalk widths don't always have to be wide and can vary in size depending on the adjacent use. Sidewalks next to retail and restaurants should be wider, but sidewalks adjacent to homes can be as narrow as six feet. How residential buildings interact with the public realm is just as important. Connecting homes directly to the sidewalk create more activity on the street, making it feel safer and therefore more used by pedestrians. Putting main entrances off driveways or through garages can make a residential street feel like a ghost town, hindering a sense of community and the creation of relationships between neighbors. Providing space directly adjacent to buildings allows activity to spill out into the streetscape. This activates the public realm and makes the place vibrant. Buildings with big, clear windows allow people inside to look outside, connecting them to city life. They provide eyes on the street, a term coined by Jane Jacobs to describe a safe and welcoming environment. Building entrances should always be prominent in the building's design and be easy to find from the street. This provokes more activity in the public realm. Another element that greatly affects how you feel in the public realm is the height and mass of buildings. The ratio of the height of buildings to the width of the street is called enclosure. A great target enclosure is one to three. For every one foot of street width, a building should be three feet tall. This creates an outdoor room surrounding its occupants in a space that is welcoming and comfortable. Breaking up larger buildings into smaller elements provides visual interest, but also makes them feel like they're more human in scale. In mixed use and walkable environments, we'll find different types of buildings and building sizes. Taller buildings should step down in height to blend with their surrounding context. In this example, a four to five story building transitions to a three story building to fit better with a two story home next door. Building placement in commercial areas should be directly adjacent to the sidewalk to provide activity to the street and create a sense of enclosure. While building placement on residential streets should allow a transition space between what is public or the sidewalk and what is private or residential. Creating a height differential and a front stoop enhances the sense of privacy while still allowing eyes on the street. Even as we make places more walkable, we still live in a car-dependent city. Accommodating parking on the sides and behind of buildings encourages buildings to be against streets, making a more successful public realm. A site is only so big, so if we can regulate where parking goes, it can encourage the building adjacent to where people are, the sidewalk. The best way to accommodate parking in an urban environment is to wrap it with active uses. You can see this type of building all throughout our city. Walk up and down Brooklyn Village Way or Moorhead Street to see wrapped mixed-use buildings. This allows active uses to be brought forward to the street. Finally, open space, especially in an urban environment, is critical to the creation of community and the celebration of identity. These are the places where people can come together to be with one another and love where they live. If you'd like to learn more about urban design at the City of Charlotte, I welcome you to visit the Urban Design Center and placemaking program websites. Follow us on social media and sign up for our blog and newsletter. Not only will you hear more about our projects and work, you can stay in the know with industry topics and research. I also invite you to visit our South End Studio, which is open by appointment. Our team welcomes you to discuss and explore a design issue you might have. We also host a number of events, fun and educational. We're located right on the rail trail at Bland Station, accessible to the entire city. Thank you so much for joining me for a quick dive into urban design. I look forward to speaking with you and taking any questions. Good evening. My name is Christy Harpst, and I am the program manager for the Historic District Commission as part of the Design and Preservation Division of the Planning Department. And I'm going to be speaking to you about community character. First, we're going to talk about what is community character and then protecting community character in Charlotte with an introduction to historic preservation and some other new tools available in Charlotte for protecting community character. So let's start by talking about what it is. Most people, when they think of historic preservation and community character, 
they think it just means saving old buildings, the best of the best, and turning them into museums like Mount Vernon and more locally, the Alexander Homestead. And that is an important part and wonderful that these buildings are saved and protected cultural assets. But preservation and community character is so much more wide ranging. It's about maintaining the sometimes ordinary, everyday, built environment in active use as places of business, restaurants, and homes. So this is Charleston, South Carolina, and this is one of the first places where preservation began in the United States. And I bring this up because I hear so often from people in Charlotte comparing Charlotte to Charleston in terms of character and old buildings, saying that because Charlotte does not look like Charleston, that Charlotte's old and historic buildings are not worthy of being preserved. And I don't feel that that's an equitable comparison to make because both places are unique. They have different stories, architecture, culture, people, development patterns. And with that, distinctive character and diverse places exist in many different forms across the United States. This is just a brief example of all the different ways community character is displayed across the country. You have Route 66, you have curbside ice cream stands along Historic Route 1, and then more locally, the Excelsior Club, the Siloam School, mid-century modern architecture at Hyde Park Estates, Charlotte's tree-lined streets, and even cemeteries. So now that we have a few examples of what community character can be, how do you more practically define community character? You define it by looking at the history, environment, and assets of a place. And every place has these three things. And it doesn't have to be the most historical event or oldest building to have character or to be important. You just need to take the time to evaluate, identify, and define it. Defining the character is the first step in protecting and enhancing it. And one of the most well-known tools for protecting community character is historic preservation that I've already touched on. This is the practical definition of preservation, but today, preservation, it's not what it was in the 60s and 70s when people were focused on protecting buildings based on architectural character, but were okay with buildings that aren't that distinctive or were uninteresting that were being demolished. In the 1980s, if it wasn't Victorian architecture, it was important. Swaths of bungalows were demolished just because they were not considered beautiful enough or historic enough because they weren't Victorian. And today, bungalows are a hot commodity. New construction homes are incorporating architectural features of the bungalow and craftsman style all across Charlotte. And it's the houses pictured here, the American small house and the ranch houses that today aren't seen as important because they're not bungalows. This is following up on Erin's presentation that she just gave on urban design and how urban design and community character is a result of good urban design and how historic places usually embody the important urban design elements that Aaron discussed. So social, economic, environmental, you have the human scale height, the building placement, the active edges, on-street parking, clear prominent entrances, a sidewalk pedestrian zone, all these different features that Aaron spoke about. So this is a commercial example. And then more locally, we have a residential example. The street in Wesley Heights is in the Wesley Heights local local historic district. And here, preservation is protecting a period of Charlotte's history when we were a small textile town. Again, it's preserving a great environment that is defined by strong urban design. We're going to switch now and talk a little more specifically about the process and potential actions that can be taken to honor and protect community and neighborhood character here in Charlotte. There is a sliding scale of character preservation on both ends from no protection to the most protection are things that are handled by outside entities. So you you have the National Register, which is no protection, that's honorary, that's handled through the state and federal government. And then on the other side that provides the most protection are covenants and easements. And these are customized people, property owners self-select to add these to their property. This is the only way in North Carolina that property can be totally protected against demolition. And this is worked out with nonprofits such as the Mecklenburg County Landmarks Commission, who does work with covenants and easements and other nonprofits in the state. But the ones we're going to focus on talking about today are the ones highlighted in the middle, what the city of Charlotte has in its toolbox to help neighborhoods maintain community character and have a voice in how the community grows and develops over time. There were three new tools adopted as part of the recent Unified Development Ordinance. This is the Neighborhood Character Overlay District Zoning, Residential Infill Overlay Zoning, and the Local Historic District Overlay Zoning Street Side. The Local Historic District Overlay Zoning has existed since the 1970s, but you can see that there was a big 
gap between state and national register honorary and recognition and local historic district zoning. So this is sort of provides more of a suite tools that neighborhoods and communities can use. We're going to talk about each of them individually, starting with the historic district overlay. And all of these tools are zoning overlays. The historic district's zoning overlay is used to manage change through a design review process. It cannot prevent demolition, but it can determine the size, height, and design of what goes back if a property is demolished. Zoning regulates the land use and other items like number of parking spaces, but the historic district regulates the size, scale, massing, setback, and all of the other features of new construction in these areas. The historic district is more restrictive than underlying zoning in terms of all those things, the height, setback, materials. And in the world of zoning, when you have overlay districts, the most restrictive applies. Before we get too far into what historic district overlays look like in Charlotte, there are a couple of things that I want everyone to come away with knowing about preservation in general and how the, everything is set up at the government and nonprofit level. So there are three, of course, everyone knows federal, state, and local, and then there's government and nonprofit arms. So I am primarily going to be focusing on the government arm and talking about the Charlotte Historic District Commission, which is part of the city of Charlotte. I'm also going to mention our sister organization, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Historic Landmark Commission, which is part of Mecklenburg County. But there are these other partners that do other things related to historic preservation that we want everyone to be aware of. The other thing that people should be aware of, as I've mentioned National Register before, there's often confusion between what the National Register is and what a local historic district is. And the National Register is America's official list of historic places worthy of preservation. It identifies, it honors places, it documents places. The other benefit to National Register listing is there are state and federal tax incentives available for rehabilitation projects. For example, Optimist Hall, which I think everyone should be familiar with, that's a recent tax credit project. It's on the National Register. It is not located within a local district. Local districts, like I mentioned earlier, there is zoning overlay put in place by the city of Charlotte, and they protect properties through a design review process. We review the outside of the entire property, including backyards, not just what is seen from the street. And so this chart shows where the National Register and the local districts intersect. Dilworth, Wesley Heights, and Hermitage Court, which is part of the Myers Park neighborhood, they are both a National Register district and a local historic district. So property owners in those neighborhoods get the advantage of the tax credits by being listed on the National Register, but also the protection afforded by being in a local historic district. Wanted to touch briefly on the two different organizations, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Historic Landmarks Commission and the Charlotte Historic District Commission. And we are often confused, but we are two different organizations. The Landmarks Commission is run out of the county. The District Commission, which is my organization, is run out of the city. District Commission does neighborhoods, large groups of properties, and the Landmarks Commission does individual properties. There is some overlap, as seen on the screen. All of these buildings, the Van Landingham Estate, the Fire Station in Fourth Ward, the Wadsworth House, and the Wilmore School, they're both landmarks and districts. So those property owners work collaboratively with both the Historic District Commission and the Landmarks Commission when they wish to make changes or improvements to their property. The Historic Landmarks Commission also has some additional things that they work on. They can buy and sell properties, and they also have a tax abatement program. We don't have that here at the city, but maybe someday. Talking a little more specifically about the districts, again, groups of properties, neighborhoods, there are eight local historic districts in Charlotte. Most of them are just outside the 277 loop. The Historic District Commission started in 1976 with Fourth Ward. It was started as an active city council as part of the greater redevelopment efforts of Fourth Ward and Uptown. And throughout the years, new districts have been added. Dilworth is our largest district, Hermitage Court, part of Myers Park neighborhood is our smallest. Most of the neighborhoods were built in the late 18, early 1900s. Streetcar suburbs developed through the 1940s, with the exception of Oakland Park and McCrory Heights. 
Oakland Park and McCurry Heights are the two newest districts, and they are mid-century neighborhoods, so 1950s, 1960s architecture, and they're also historically African-American neighborhoods. And these, this number of districts could increase through new neighborhoods being designated or even existing neighborhoods that want to expand their districts. A little bit about the commission and historic districts. Beyond having eight local districts, there's about 3,000 properties covering over 700 acres. The commission and its staff review over 400 applications annually, and the majority of those are in Dilworth and Wilmore. One thing to point out is that historic districts comprise less than 1% of all the parcels that are under the purview of the city of Charlotte. Historic districts are only created when residents ask for them. This city does not designate local districts without the request of a neighborhood. Administration of the program is done by staff and Historic District Commission. The Historic District Commission consists of members appointed by the mayor and council, and representatives include neighborhood residents and design professionals like architects, contractors, realtors, landscape architects. If you are located in one of those eight local historic districts that I showed on the map a few slides back, this is what is reviewed. Within the local districts, the commission and its staff reviews all demolition, construction, additions, or exterior alterations to those properties. All work has to be improved in advance by the commission or its staff, and all reviews must adhere to the Adopted Design Standards Manual shown here. This manual is a guidebook for property owners and the commission when approaching additions, changes, and new projects in the districts. An important distinction of the commission is that the commission follows a quasi-judicial process. It's not legislative like city council. Another distinction is the commission only reviews the exterior of buildings. They review all four sides and yards. They don't look at things like kitchen and bath outfits or anything you do on the inside. They don't regulate land use. Again, base zoning determines what land uses are allowed. And just things to keep in mind is that usually what the commission says, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. They allow modern materials to an extent. There are some modern materials not permitted like vinyl and fiberglass, and they do expedite emergency repairs. But most critically, commissioners, it should not be taste specific. Commissioners do not have to like a project. It does not have to be to their taste or their design aesthetic. If the project meets the standards, it must be approved. The breakdown between staff review and full commission review is about 60-40. 60% of the projects are reviewed at the staff level. Staff is authorized by the commission. They are given the authority to review the projects seen here. The commission saves for themselves the big impact projects the demolitions, the large additions, the new construction, changes to the fronts of buildings. If you're submitting for a staff review, this is the flow chart that you would follow. But what's most important to note is that all staff review projects are assigned to an individual staff member. So staff works with applicants and walks them through the process. You work one-on-one, they hold your hand throughout the whole process. The end result is the issuance of what we call a COA, and that stands for Certificate of Appropriateness. And this is a document certifying that a project in a historic district meets the standards outlined in the design standards. The COA is also required to obtain a building permit. Currently, staff reviews are usually completed within 30 days. Now, if it's a bigger project, it requires full commission review, and the commission meets once a month, and they hold public hearings. There are required fees for a large application. The public is noticed through legal notice letters that are sent out, postings to the website, and again, and all reviews need to relate back to the adopted design standards. The commission follows the quasi-judicial process. That means that the commission, if you picture a courtroom, the commission is like judges and the applicants are like attorneys. And the attorneys are using the design standards book to prove why their new construction or their addition meets the design standards. The projects can take anywhere from one to six months for approval. It just depends on the size and scope of the project. There are some delays right now with the commission due to COVID the volume of projects received, and we've also had an increase of larger and more complex multifamily and commercial projects. So once a project goes through either the full commission review flowchart or the staff review flowchart, 
I mentioned the certificate of appropriateness, and this is what the certificate of appropriateness looks like. It's our version of a permit. It includes a written description of the project, the stamped architectural plans, and then we also send this placard to all the property owners to post in their window so that their neighbors and the public know that this project was approved. The COA and the plans are also posted to the planning department website and sent to zoning and permitting. This is an example of a new construction project, a multifamily project in Wesley Heights, and how the project changed with input from the commission. So you can see at the top, the project is almost turned and looking in on itself and has these tall blank walls towards the existing quadruplexes. The commission said you need to better integrate the project with the street and the neighboring buildings. And so the applicant came back and you can see that they looked at door and window placement, roof lines, providing a transition and the building now steps down to these existing houses. And then we have a single family example in a row of historic bungalows. You can see on here where the new build is. It's slightly taller than its neighbors, but it still fits in with the neighboring homes. It has a front porch, the setback, the character of the project all fits within the streetscape. Next, we're going to talk about the historic district overlay street side. And this is a new tool adopted as part of the UDO. This is the same as a historic district. District. None currently exist in Charlotte. Again, it's a brand new tool. We have the tool available, but there are no street side historic districts in Charlotte. It's the same as historic district in terms of the process with staff review, full commission review, the types of projects reviewed, but it's limited to what is viewed from the street and the public rights away. So in most cases, unless you're a corner lot, it doesn't include the backyards of properties. This graphic should help explain a little better. It's about the character of the street and what's visible to the pedestrian from the side sidewalk. The review is limited to the first 50% of the house and the first 50% of the lot. There are some exceptions. So new construction on corner lots are completely reviewed. New construction in a mid-block vacant lot would be completely reviewed. And if you're making changes above the eaves of the roof, so you're adding a dormer, you're changing the roof, that is reviewed. Or if you're building an addition to the side, making the house wider, that would be reviewed because those things are visible from the public rights away. But anything in the backyard, if you're not on a corner lot and you want to do something in your backyard, anything that meets zoning is fine. Sheds, swimming pools, accessory buildings, patios, fire pits, none of that would require review by the Historic District Commission. So why would you use Streetside? Well, you would use it when you want to preserve the character of an area, but allow more flexibility in the backyards that don't have that large impact. It still provides the most control over the character of the neighborhood as it's experienced from the street. The historic district and the street side are an elective tool that give neighborhoods a voice in their future. Just summarizing it up, it's the strongest tool available, but the citizens participate fully in the designation process. The process is completely neighborhood-led. Staff provides technical assistance, and it's about empowering communities and shaping their future and reducing vulnerability to displacement. But most critically, it requires consensus and a grassroots effort from the neighborhood. It is not downward directed by the city. So just a brief refresher of the action and tools chart, and we are going to be focusing next on neighborhood character and residential infill because historic districts, they're not right for every neighborhood. It's great that we have those tools. Very excited about the new street side tool. But again, that might not be right for every neighborhood. These new tools were adopted as part of the Unified Development Ordinance, and they're an equal choice. It, it really depends on what the neighborhood's goals are. The overlays can regulate different features in different ways, and so it's really important that the neighborhood understands what their goals are and they select the overlay that's the best fit. Again, because these were part of the new UDO, there are none of these in place in Charlotte. Other communities do have similar ordinances in place, but there are no neighborhood character overlay districts in Charlotte as of yet. The neighborhood character overlay district, it's aimed at reducing conflict between new construction and existing development and encouraging new development and redevelopment consistent with existing neighborhood characteristics. It is residential only, and it can also be a transition between a local historic district and adjacent residential areas. 
I should note that the Community Planning Academy and Civic Leadership Academy, a lot of these new overlays came out of request from these groups. They saw this presentation in past years when I was simply talking about historic districts and that being the only tool we had in Charlotte. And the neighborhoods and the neighborhood leaders attending these academies were asking for additional options to help guide development, redevelopment, and other tools that were neighborhood driven to help them manage growth and change in their neighborhoods. So with the neighborhood care Character. It is a menu of options. It is completely customizable by neighborhood. One thing to point out, it cannot regulate appearance. So in North Carolina, only historic districts can regulate appearance. But the menu of option includes things like lot width, setback, building height for both principal and accessory buildings, maximum building coverage, the location of surface parking, and some tree planting and protection standards. The goal is to encourage compatible new infill or additions in terms of lot size, height, and the key is that these elements have to already exist in the neighborhood. This is not for desired features that don't exist to create a new development pattern. The elements that are self-selected by the neighborhood have to already be on the ground in the neighborhood. Again, it's a residential zoning district only. It cannot modify any existing covenants or deed restrictions, and it applies broadly to all new construction, all additions, changes, expansions, and alterations to single family, duplex, and triplex. It cannot prevent the construction of duplex and triplex in the neighborhood. The important thing to note, the distinction between a neighborhood character overlay and the residential infill overlay is that there is a planning process. The process starts with the analysis of the existing neighborhood conditions. There is the creation of a neighborhood character plan and a lot of public engagement. It also requires a lot of grassroots neighborhood support. Community involvement is also required in providing a petition of support by the property owners within the proposed district boundary. And ultimately, this is a rezoning approved by city council. So to be eligible, the first step is evaluating the existing neighborhood, the patterns of development, or even a portion of the neighborhood to determine if it has consistent features. The streets, lots, and buildings should share common features such as how close the buildings are to the street, how tall the houses are, how close the buildings are to each other, where people park their vehicles, if there are sheds and garages in the backyards and the presence of large trees. So say you find that there are common features in a neighborhood or a portion of a neighborhood, you move on to the second step to determine does it meet the standard of having a minimum of 15 contiguous acres. All lots on the same block face have to be included. The area has to have been developed at least 25 years ago and at least 75% of the lots have to be developed. So you can see the map here, this area would be eligible because it has consistency and setback development patterns and building size, location, and there are very few vacant lots. So again, why would you use the neighborhood character overlay? to manage growth and development. It cannot prevent demolition, but it can help determine the size, height, and location of what gets built. The best way to think about it is it, it just establishes a more defined box that a new building can go in. And this example in Cherry shows how drastically the intersection of Luther and Torrance Streets have changed in just an eight-year span. And so this is where, had a neighborhood character overlay been in place, it could have helped restrict the height of some of that new development so that it doesn't overpower some of those existing one-story houses that are still there. And lastly, we have the residential infill overlay. It's another new tool as part of the UDO. None of these exist currently in Charlotte, and we call it Rio. So Rio is different from neighborhood character because there is no menu of option. It is all or nothing. So Rio determines front setback from the street. They average the two closest single family buildings to the street, but they can't be any less than 10 feet. It looks at the building setback plane. The building sidewall height can be a max of 20 feet or an average of the adjacent single family houses. This also helps limit total building height. And then thirdly, maximum building size and its average heated square footage. Diagram should help explain this a little better. You can see the setback from the street, the building sidewall height limited to 20 feet max, or an average of the adjacent properties. And it also, again, can limit the total maximum height by district by limiting the sidewall height. So the process is also slightly different for Rio. It can be initiated by city council, by majority vote of city council, or by property owners representing 51% of the land area in the proposed boundary. Neighbor 
neighborhood character is only applied to residential zoning, so single-family duplex and triplex. And again, it can't be used to prevent duplex and triplex development in single-family neighborhoods. There's a larger uh, size requirement. It needs to be a minimum of 50 contiguous lots, but there's no age limit. And the process is similar. It is a rezoning process. So why would you use Rio instead of neighborhood character? This can be put in place much more quickly than neighborhood character. There's no planning. There's no analysis. It is simply those three items that are put in place in a specific area. So if you want to curb infill development quickly, this is probably the way your neighborhood would go. But remember, Rios don't preserve character. The development can still look completely different than how your neighborhood looks today. And just to sum up, I want to end with what these tools can't do. So these tools can't determine density. They can't determine land use. So duplex, triplex, rentals, they can't prevent accessory dwelling units. They can't control the market or impact affordability. They can't address noise, traffic, and litter nuisances. Those are handled through the code enforcement process. If you're having those issues, call 311. They'll help you out. It also can't control architectural features or demolition. That would be Rio and NCO only. Historic districts can control architectural features and can delay demolition. We cannot prevent it completely in North Carolina. Most importantly, these overlays can't be used together. So neighborhoods need to be thoughtful about what is the best fit for their neighborhood because only one can be used. You can't have both a Rio and a neighborhood character over the same area. And then with Rio and neighborhood character, again, it's only for residential development. Historic districts are the only overlay that can help protect non-residential development. And we also have a quick comparison chart showing what the different overlays can and can't do. This chart and additional information about the process to designate the various overlays, a much more in-depth process, frequently asked questions. There's an at-a-glance fact sheet and application information for these overlays is available on the UDO website. So I would just end by encouraging you to look around and start noticing the character of different parts of Charlotte next time you're walking in your neighborhood or driving around town and recognize that Charlotte's architecture and neighborhoods are just as special in its own way and worthy of our pride and preservation efforts. Thank you. Thank you.